Hi everyone, this is Ron Wasserman, and uh, my friend Michael sent me some questions here to answer about my career and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I'll just start right off. The first question is, uh, when did you first get into music? So um, I guess I started playing piano when I was three years old, according to my mom. I don't remember any of this. But uh, she told me that I would sleep with records instead of stuffed animals. And if I was hugging a little record, I could go to sleep. And that I always tried to get out of the crib and get over to the record player. And I remember it was about that time they, uh, my mom and dad bought me my first piano, which was this uh, big black upright piano. I can't remember if it was a Wurlitzer or whatnot. But uh, we got it for 25 bucks, and it was... Um, in pretty bad shape my dad did what he could to fix it up but it wasn't so good but i think they got that for me because a it's all we could afford we were pretty poor and um they wanted to see if i would really really put my heart and soul into it before they put out the big bucks for another piano which they did when i was uh five years old uh my folks and my uncle got together and bought me a great used Wurlitzer spinet piano, which I still have to this day. And I uh, started writing when I was about five years old and uh, pretty much never stopped. So that's how I really got into it. Second question is, what is my favorite genre of music? Or what are my influences nowadays and from the past when I was growing up? Okay, when I was growing up, I pretty much only listen because we you know only had radio so um, we had some records but I grew up pretty much just listening the top 40 radio which my dad hated he always wanted to listen to the news station in Los Angeles but when he wasn't around I was always able to um, have a radio and would just listen to anything I could and, you know, like today, it kind of runs the gamut. I'll listen to extreme hard rock. I rarely listen to Top 40 because it all sounds like the same crap to me now. But, uh, you know, luckily I have satellite radio and I can bounce around stations for whatever mood I'm in. Listen to a lot of classical if I need to chill out. And I think it's a great influence because it's not a set arrangement so it can take you anywhere and it's always pretty interesting when i was a teenager i gotta admit i was definitely hard rock now i'm older so uh my influences main influences were black sabbath led zeppelin van halen genesis and probably some jethro tull in there and maybe nah. Anyway, so those were the main things. A lot of progressive rock. Okay, next question is, where did I study for my career in music? Okay, I... Again, you know, we grew up really poor. So uh, the music lessons I took in Reseda, California were pretty simplistic. But I remember going every Saturday, and what I would do is this cool little trick. I'd bring my little tape recorder, and my lesson for that week I would get the teacher to play it for me and then I would just listen to that and I would do a version by ear because I wasn't really interested in reading I could read a little bit but it just it was overwhelming I wanted to do my own versions so um, I would go back the next Saturday and I would play the song and it took usually about uh, two three months for each of my teachers to figure this out they would kind of pull the music away and say you're not reading and I said, nah, you know, but look what I did, this little thing here. You know, it was kind of old school teachers, so they didn't like that. And I was usually asked to leave. And that, um, that happened with every teacher I ever had. And then in college, I tried to take music theory again. And although the first day I remember the uh, teacher played something. And he said, by the time you're done with this, you'll be able to tell me what I played and what the chords should be and the voicings are. And while he was doing it, I'd written it all out. I'm not trying to sound special here. I'm just saying that it's in me, right? So um, I said, oh, you played so-and-so and so-and-so and, -so and gave him the progression and all that. And he said, why are you here? I said, because I don't know anything about theory. 
So about uh, three weeks into that class, he didn't really ask me to leave, but he kind of sat me down and gave me the big lecture on how I wasn't focusing on the regular theory um, that he was teaching, and that without that, I'd probably not go anywhere. Classic story you hear from anybody who goes anywhere. <laughs> but, you know, I'm not, I'm not dissing it. I'm not dissing it. It's great. It's just I didn't want to score films, so I didn't really need to know that stuff. And half the guys who do score films don't know that stuff. All right, uh, next question is, did you have a band during the late 80s? Yeah, I actually had my first band in the early 80s, and we were playing around L.A. Nothing was really happening. I think we were okay, but we weren't great. But, uh, you know, it's all a learning process. And then I was in this new wave band, which I'm not going to mention the name of. Well, I should. Yeah, it was called... Oh, this is embarrassing. Betty Boop and the Beat. Yes. <clears throat> don't, don't, uh, don't Google that. So uh, we were offered record deals on and off, but could never really um, come together on negotiating that, which was probably better. And uh, our lead singer was getting a little wacky. So uh, that band broke up. And then I, I was at a club playing with somebody. And I was approached by this gal, E.G. Daly, who had just done a movie with Pee Wee Herman playing his girlfriend. And she had just signed a deal with A&M and said, hey, you want to uh, be in the band? So I ended up being in the band. I was MD, uh, music director, which was great. And the band was incredible. E.G. was great. And uh, the drummer was Matt Sorum, who went on to Guns N' Roses. And the bass player was Matt Bissonette, who went on to play with David Lee Roth and everybody else. And I cannot for the life of me remember who the guitar player was. But anyways, had a great few months there. Things were going great. Then uh, we were going to go off to Europe and tour. And um, something went wrong somewhere in the deal. And a and kind of decided not to promote the project anymore. So that was the end of that, unfortunately. Uh, next question is, uh, when did you first start producing music for TV shows with Saban the First? I'd done a couple little bits for other shows prior. A uh, Jack Klugman show called You Again, and I can't remember the other one. But I went into Saban in 1989 just to engineer for their existing composers. And after doing that, I thought, well, hell, I can do this. So I started learning how to score which took about two years of doing my engineering gig there or whatever else I was doing. And then uh, when no one was around, I would use the studio and just write stuff. And I'd give it to show producers. They had about five or six of them. And those guys were great. And they would give me back notes. I remember the first notes were, uh, score is not a song. It's a completely different beast. Uh, so I studied it more, listened to a lot more scores, and started figuring out how to do it. And then I did like a couple bits for some of their uh, direct to VHS video programs. And uh, of course the first big one, uh, total, total luck was uh, Power Rangers. Next question is, uh, how did I come to work for Saban? Um, well, I started there in 89. I went in for one weekend to engineer and uh, ended up staying there for six years. So next question is uh, from writing Go Go Power Rangers. Did that kickstart my career and open other doors? Yes and no. Um, because, you know, the internet was just kind of starting up. There was AOL back then. So I wasn't really able to chat directly with any of the fans. And Saban really kept me hidden because uh, for business reasons and frankly, I was working 70, 80 hours a week there because I was doing Power Rangers and Sweet Valley High and stuff for VR Troopers and a couple other shows. So it was, it was a pretty crazy time. Um, but after I left there in September 95, most of the industry knew what I did and it was pretty easy to meet with other people and, and get other music gigs. Next question, favorite song from MMPR would be uh, We Need a Hero. That was always my favorite song. And um, I don't know, just uh, it started off as a piano ballad, a slow piano ballad, which of course would never get used. And then I turned it into a rock song, so that was fun. Uh, the next question is about the process of writing a Power Rangers song. I would um, I'd finish up 
doing my score for the show, which I averaged like between seven and nine minutes of score, which uh, was really fast. But, you know, a lot of the sounds were already established and it was just a matter of making sure everything hit to picture correctly. So I would just kind of start messing around with guitar riffs and I think because I was writing at such a quick pace in those days, stuff just kind of flowed out of me much quicker. I was able to come up with the riff and once I had that, I've been, you know, like I said, writing melody since I was four or five years old. So writing that part would come out quickly. What took a little bit more time sometimes are the lyrics. Um, next question is, were there any PR tracks that you thought were over the top or not heavy enough? Not at the time. Now when I listen back, you know, a lot of it was synth stuff and it doesn't sound nearly as punchy as today's stuff. But, you know, I was recording to tape. There was no budget for, believe it or not, no budget, a live musician. So I pretty much played everything. But uh, Ron Kanan, who was president of music there, or this guy Bruce Watson, which was great. They'd come in and play guitar every once in a while, so that worked out very nice. Um, but yeah, I thought I thought the stuff was certainly heavy enough. Oh, here's a good thing: asking about no more minor chords. There was a time where uh, there was a lot of violence going on between kids, and they were trying to blame the songs because I would have a word like "fight" in them, and so. Uh, those complaints made their way all the way to the White House, and I guess Al Gore or his wife Tipper Gore told Saban, because they were all friends, maybe I should not use certain words and uh, no more minor chords. So I remember that day they came in and said, uh, you know, write in major chords which are more positive and don't use words like fight or hit or this or that or what off. And I just went, okay, and I just kind of wrote around it. And, you know, not a bad thing. You can, I just had to learn how to make tracks that had a lot of energy that stayed in major happy chords. And regarding that violence that, you know, kids fighting because of the song, I had offered um, at any time to meet with the parents on CNN of those kids and um, a couple minutes into that, I think the public would have seen that uh, the problem their kids were having with fighting had really nothing to do with the songs. But, you know, some people like to blame bands for uh, violence. The next question is about the missing digital audio tapes. Um, I guess when Disney bought Saban, a lot of the master recordings were lost, the individual tracks. Now, I've heard they found them again. But um, I don't really know for sure. So the next question was, would I be able to make instrumentals if I had those? And they do exist on those tapes, uh, but I don't have them. And uh, I certainly wouldn't be able to get them. So there you go. Next question is the highs and lows, but also funny times working at Saban. You know, it was a ton of work. And doing all those shows, I was just getting exhausted. But the rush of having that kind of popularity with the show that you're working on and you know vr troopers was doing okay and sweet valley high okay and i was doing other stuff for them so that alone took care of the highs the lows were just the constant constant workload and that's really the main reason i left in the end of 95 i was just completely burned out next question is about the mmpr movie the first one um I got called to 20th Century Fox. They sent me a few scenes to score. I scored them. They absolutely loved them. And then Haim came to me and said, you're not doing the movie. And he ended up hiring the guy who had done The Crow. And, uh, well, you've heard the score. It's a nice, big orchestral score. Completely unlike the movie. So, there you go. Yeah, next question is about Metallica asking me to open for him. Yeah, that it that was going to happen at Irvine Meadows, and um, Saban turned it down in my behalf. Odd story, but you know, I wasn't really upset about it. I'm not really a live performer, my wife is, and the thought of standing in front of who knows how many people, I probably would have been terrified, fainted or some silly stuff. All right, next question is, uh, am I aware of how popular the music is 20 years later? 
Yes, because I get emails every day and have now for nearly 20 years. So pretty remarkable, actually. It would have been great to go back and do the series again, but that's the way showbiz goes. What can you do?